for joining in. Let's see, I think we're right at uh, 1030, so we might as well go ahead and get started. We have a pretty full agenda. Again, I'm Peg Miller, a pediatrician in McMinnville and one of the co-chairs. Um, maybe we'll start with just some um, uh, brief introductions and uh, if people can share a little bit about what's going well for them. Uh, Peter. <laughs> Good morning, Peg. Good morning. I'm Peter, I'm Peter Buckley of the Early Learning Council. Um, we got people are writing things in the chat, which are great. Uh -huh. um, so uh, what's going well with me? I'm not going to get in the chat because I got called first. Um, we're doing uh, some some excellent work here with the peer support specialist in Jackson Josephine County, the traditional health workers, uh, and uh, it's uh, it's making some good progress. And there seem to be some resources as well. So that's going, that's going well for me. And I'll, I'll toss it over to Ruby. Good morning, Ruby Ramirez, she, her pronouns, program officer for early childhood, the Oregon Community Foundation. And I'm one of the work team's co-chairs. It's going well for me. Um, I have a big childcare initiative that uh, OCF and others have been supporting. We are getting ready to choose three additional pilot regions to grow from three to six. So we're really excited about that, but it's gonna be a tough decision. Um, so we'll see how that goes. I will pass it over to, let's see who's on my screen. Um, how about Kate? Thanks, Ruby. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kate Wilcox, she, her pronouns. I'm the maternal and child health section manager at State Public Health and OHA. And what's going well for you, for me? Um, so December's a really um, busy time because we have a birthday and then Christmas and then another birthday. And um, so I, I'm trying not to stress out. And usually by now, if I don't have certain things in place, I'm stressing and I don't necessarily have those in place. And I'm trying to stay very zen about it. So. Um, so far, I'm doing okay. <laughs> we'll see how long that lasts. All right, let's see. Brenda, I see you on my screen. Hi, Brenda Kamini from the Early Learning Hub of Central Oregon, and I use uh, she, her pronouns. Um, I put in the chat box that we're getting ready to move our team into a new space, and that's like a very abbreviated statement for the year long <laughs> process this has taken. Um, so I'm very happy um, to report that. And it's all, it's always good when it's all new, fresh, you know, um, wonderful landlord. And so, and they will finally not be on top of each other in the space that we've been kind of pigeonholed into. So that is all good. I'm also really excited that our, um, Family Connects work has finally gotten the nod after almost a year's work as well to move into the hospital to do recruitment. And uh, we're taking advantage of the contractor consultant um, that ELD and OHA has brought forward for us. And he's going to help us um, kind of navigate some of those conversations about how we make this work the best that we can for families of new babies. So um, who to pass it to? Gwen, you're next on my screen. Hi, good morning, Gwen Bachtel, um, pronoun she, her with the Oregon Early Learning Division. And what's going well is I've, um, about to wrap up some um, recruitments and I have like two great new people who will be starting with us in the new year. So I'm really thrilled about that. I'd say that seems to be going well. Um, just continuing on to make sure we have capacity. So that's 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 what I'm happy about and feeling good about and um, going well right now. So I'll be able to take off some of the hats that I'm wearing. <laughs> so um, let's see, um, I saw, I see Melissa, are you ready to come off? Okay. I am. Hello, everyone. Uh, Melissa is an IHNC school. 
uh, over in Lynn Benton, Lincoln County region. Um, something that's going well for me. Well, I work in Medicaid and oversee Medicaid contracts. So there's a lot of things <laughs> that I don't want to talk about. But I think I will focus on my internal team is just so lovely and I just appreciate um, them always supporting and rolling with the punches. I have a great group of folks that I work with, um, with a lot of different niches and expertise. And I think that just, just helps us all get through the policy directives coming down. Who to pass it to? I joined a few minutes late. I apologize. So who has not gone? I'm seeing the next. One. Okay. I'm Mary Galen. I she her pronouns, and I'm the Family First and Integrated Policy Manager with Oregon Department of Human Services, both self sufficiency and child welfare. Um, and what makes me happy is personal one that I put in the chat. But I have a Christmas tree that is wider than it is tall. <laughs> and it's like my favorite Christmas tree I've had. So far, my husband and I just tried to do silly ones. Um, and we found the best Christmas tree. So that's making me happy right now. And I will pass to Rick. Have you gone? I have not. Thanks, Mary. Um, um, hello, my name is Rick Ruzica. Uh, he, him pronouns. I am the Assistant Director of Planning and Policy uh, at Oregon Housing and Community Services. Um, this is a, this is a tough question because it's been a rough couple of days. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say uh, job security. <laughs> I feel like really good about my job right now because um, uh, I don't know. Uh, we we just don't have enough manpower to do everything we're 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 supposed to be doing. So um, feeling like I um, I'm not going anywhere anytime soon because uh, we've got a lot to dig out from. So we'll go with that. Um, and I will pass it to Robin. Thank you. Hi, I'm Robin Hill Dunbar. She, her pronouns. I'm from I'm a senior program officer in the Children, Youth, and Families Department at the Ford Family Foundation. Uh, I, I said staying cool during the uh, hustle and bustle of the holidays, but I related to work. Part of that staying cool is this time of year. There's a lot of grants we try to get out of the grant um, portal through this time of the year, and all of the ones that were critical have made it through that little process and so I feel like now I can breathe and you know enjoy the lights and things that this time of the year brings I really like lights um let's see uh Serena have you been Serena or Kelly sorry I couldn't get my mouse to work this is Serena <laughs> I hear you thanks Sorry, Robin. Um, hi, Serena Stoudemire Wesley, um, Early Learning um, Deputy Director and Chief of Program. What's going well for me right now is, um, oh, my home, my townhome purchase is going great. I'm really excited about that. So yeah, well, I better cross my fingers at no hiccups. So yeah. <laughs> Downsizing has been great, so yeah. And I will pass on to um, Ruby. Have you gone, Brenda? You've gone. Okay, Kelly. Oh, Sue. Sue hasn't gone. She just got here too. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Sorry to be late. Um, What's going well? Um, I think getting ready for a family Christmas party on Saturday. That's going to be really fun. Um, and I'll be have some late nights to get ready, but it'll be fun. It'll be fun. Uh, so Peg, I'll pass it to you. I started things off, but neglected to say what was going well. And probably the best thing that's gone well for me is I got an inpatient bed for a kid that I'd been boarding in the emergency room for over a day. Uh, and that was a big success. So um, the inpatient pediatric beds are at a premium right now. Uh, I don't think we've heard 
from Benjamin, we did talk a little bit about your puppy, but um, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure, Benjamin Hazelton, uh, he, him, uh, Home Visiting Policy and Systems Coordinator with the Health Authority. Um, in addition to the puppy, when something is going well, and I can't believe I didn't think about this, is we have a bunch of rescue plan funding that we have converted into Safeway gift cards. So I just sent out over $2,050 gift cards to McVie families um, for Safeway that they can use for everything but alcohol, tobacco, and lottery tickets. And to Neil. Thank you. To Neil Motherwell, uh, she, her pronouns, assistant superintendent at the Office of Enhancing Student Opportunities in ODE. And we launched a new general supervision plan a little bit ago, and things are going really well. It's hard, tough work, but the districts are doing really well, and the staff are doing really well. And so it's all you could hope for. Uh, and Kelly. Hi everyone, my name is Kelly Taylor. I am the Administrative Specialist for the Program Unit at ELD. My pronouns are they, them. And what is going good for me is that we got custody of our kiddo recently. So that was a very long drawn out process that is still ongoing. It's partially completed. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, I know we haven't heard from Christy. Anybody else? Then Christy, you can close us in. Okay, we'll do. Hi, everyone. My name is Christy Cox. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a contractor that's helping to support uh, the committee and the working team on this. And uh, I really like this right here, like, and, and the stuff that's been gone out this week is what's going well. I just really am so happy to be part of the team that's been working on this. So I give that as my shout out uh, on that piece. And then I'll pass it back to you, Peg, and probably ready for the next slide, Kelly. Yeah. So just a, a couple of things by way of review, it's always good to kind of ground ourselves in what our purpose was. And this is uh, well explained here. I guess um, part of my statement is that this is not the end of the work of this committee. Uh, you know, we're all going to be able to take a break and kind of uh, take a deep breath uh, at the end of this, but um, we will be engaging folks again as we kind of move forward uh, because part of our um, our mission was to uh, sustain momentum for developing this system. So um, any other comments about that? And then Kelly, if you could give us the next slide. Um, just an overview today, um, we'll talk a little bit about the recommendations. And I guess this is a great time to really thank the working team for all the hard work that they put into this. Um, they really took this job as seriously as we do and uh, put in lots of time and energy uh, into uh, putting forth these recommendations. So thanks to all of you. Um, we will try and uh, develop some consensus on these recommendations um, kind of as they come up. And um, we're gonna, by doing that on, um, if you remember the fist to five, and we'll go over that again, but uh, on anything that was a two uh, or less, uh, we would like to discuss a little bit. So we'll pause uh, when we get to one of those recommendations. Thanks everybody for filling out the survey. Um, and then we can talk briefly about that and see if um, there's a way that we can explain that a little better uh, to, to reach better consensus. Um, and then we'll, at the very end, we'll uh, talk about kind of what the next steps are. If you remember at the very first meeting, we talked about going to where the ball will be. Uh, that's kind of the, uh, the next steps. So again, not the end of this work, but um, um, we will be hoping to, not today, but to eventually develop a, a functional action plan. Any other comments about that? There we go. And just remember, at, again, at our very first meeting, we uh, we had the working agreements uh, to be uh, present and 
uh, listen and uh, that we're here all to learn and be curious. Uh, we really wanna treat each other with respect and appreciate the value that everybody brings to the table. Um, and again, if we can have a good time in the meantime, let's do it. Next slide. Right, so I think this needs to go to Ruby maybe. Yes, thank you, Peg. Yeah. Great. So since we're reviewing recommendations today, we uh, wanted to again remind you of the process we underwent to get there. Um, the work team analyzed several sets of existing reports and documents um, about home visiting, which you've seen lists in our previous presentations, to find themes. And we did this in three phases, right? So in September, our analysis focused on parent and families experiences. In October, we looked at workforce issues. And in November, the focus was um, on home visiting systems broadly. And because we were intentionally prioritizing family voice, we did seek out some feedback on phase one findings from families and parents through a variety of existing networks. And then we use the work team findings in conjunction with parent feedback to craft these recommendations that we're bringing forth to you today. Next slide, please. Uh, so before we dive into the recommendations, I want to highlight a few things and provide some framing. So our focus uh, here is on statewide home visiting collaboration, coordination and services and, um, of, of families and programs. So these are not recommendations about programming or any specific model. It's about the coordination piece. And we're not starting from scratch. There is a lot of great work happening across the state in pockets or on a small scale, some of which we drew upon for these recommendations. Um, so we really sought to find out what's working so we can do more of it. So for example, there are McBee funded counties doing great work, rural regions that the Ford Family Foundation has been supporting, and even some CCOs have been working in this space for a while too. So there's great work happening, it's just not happening, happening uniformly or equitably across the state yet. And finally, you'll see that the recommendation language is almost exclusively about what needs to happen um, to strengthen home visiting coordination, not the who or how. So we'll be getting to who or how in our next steps. Next slide, please. So the, um, there are a few handfuls of recommendations. So we loosely bundled them in a way that hopefully makes your review of them easier. Our recommendation categories are around financial considerations, workforce, and state and regional structures. Several of these could fit in more than one bundle. We can massage the bundles at a future date if needed. Um, and I will mention that these are not in any priority order, except for the first one that focuses on relationships that I'll talk about. Next slide, please. Oh, there you go. Um, so this first recommendation is a big one um, that emerged out of every single phase of our analysis. Um, so investing in relationships is critically important to collaborative work and systems building. So the recommendation is to dedicate resources and use change management principles to support regular convenings of home visitors, home visiting leaders, and home visiting cross-sector partners um, so that they can learn about one another and one another's programs, share professional development and trainings, and begin to uh, work to create stronger collaborations. Next slide, please. The next set of recommendations is about home visiting system financing. Um, and so what we came up with was that Oregon will adequately resource the implementation of the home visiting system committee's recommendations, starting with FTE. The work team notes that resources are required at the state and local levels. So there is a need for dedicated state level FTE to provide leadership, um, staff governance structures, and move recommendations into action at the local and state level while also recognizing that dedicated FT at the regional level or local level will also be needed to actualize these home visiting system recommendations. 
Um, the next recommendation is about the development of a pooled fund that would be comprised of public and private sources to finance implementation and maintenance of these home visiting systems recommendations. And I'd like to note that the recommendations for the FTE and pooled fund are specifically for the home visiting system coordination and collaboration work. We're not suggesting pool, pooling programmatic funding. Um, I'm going to pause here as there was a two score on this recommendation about the pooled fund um, from the committee. And so we'll invite some conversation that'll get us to some form of consensus around this one. So, um, Peter, I don't know if you want to add something before folks. Just, just, jump just in. The, the, com the comment that came on the survey was Has it been identified there's not adequate state and federal funds? Uh, the following question about the assessment of funds would be helpful, which is the, the, the number D on the recommendation. So um, whoever uh, if, who gave this one a two was, would be willing to uh, further talk about their concerns. Uh, now is the time would be great to do so. It was me. It's me. Um, yeah. I was, yeah, you know, I mean, we're investing in this at the foundation and want to continue to invest in it. And I, we 100% appreciate and desire to have public private partnerships. It was just my um, desire to understand what is so that we can build on it versus just like, let's fund something. Do we even know, like, are there resources? So it was just more of a, I agree with the need, but I wanna establish the full need before I, yeah. I see some hands raised, so I'll pause. Whoever's raising hands, please. I think Melissa was Mary, first. You were first. Oh. Um, I was kind of on the fence uh, similarly with this one. I think I ended up on a three because I'm okay with it moving forward, but I felt like we needed so much more information about what kinds of funds would be pooled for what purposes. Um, I had in mind some of the conversations we had with other states. Um, and like ways in which they did pool funding. Um, and then kind of, is it like, I guess one of the questions was already answered, but is it for services or just for around our coordination? Um, so I think that was some of what was unclear in this recommendation to me um, as it was written. Yeah, and I would also say, um, I agree with that some of these recommendations we should probably build out a little bit and my concern um, as I've already expressed is there are multiple home visiting programs um, multiple touch points with individuals in the community in this space and assessments and and while deed does capture that um, it it doesn't go into anything that might point someone to the right direction, because what you don't know, you don't know. And individuals evaluating this may not pull from everything. And so again, I mean, we have a lot of home visiting um, done through the counties. DHS has also got their own thing. We have this um, Family Connects. We have um, doulas and, and we have everything else. I mean, doulas and family connects alone, $1,500 each. So that's $3,000 per person. And we're also trying all trying to get in their homes. And I don't know how invasive that is either. So those were some of the comments that I had. And Benjamin had a uh, comment in the chat of can we capture possible yes, solutions mm -hmm. like pooled funds and recognize there are steps to come next. Yeah. So that that seems it's sounding like, you know, instead of create a pooled fund, you know, develop a process to create a pooled fund mm -hmm. um, and, and clarify what the funds would be used for. I have an additional comment to, to the conversation too. Please. Um, I, I do think one of the value adds that um, private sources can bring is flexibility. Uh, public sources sometimes um, have um, strings attached. And so if, uh, you know, to, to really be transformative and 
innovative, it means thinking outside the box, which I think the private funding uh, can help us do better um, as part of that pooled fund for how we would implement and maintain the recommendations. Just a, a point of context. Great point. Any other comments on this one? My other, um, I think the um, whether pooling the funds is the right outcome, I'm not sure. But one of the things we're talking about within ODHS with some of our programs is layering of funds. So like, is this gonna be Medicaid? Is this gonna be family first? Is like, who's paying for things? Um, I think the decision-making around pooling of funds looks different. And some of those funds, like for instance, private funds that are uh, have less strings attached might become harder to access because of the additional strings attached if you pool them with um, funds that have more complex strings attached to them. So I think some of it for me is like, what do we mean by pooling the funds? And how would that be structured? Do we know already that's the outcome we want? Or is it more about aligning funding and then the method for that is to be determined from the assessment that's done. Benjamin, you're next, I think. Yeah, I went back to look at some of the, like this was, these were distilled from multiple sources and information. And so I was kind of like trying to look back at like, where do we get this from? And I think one of the bullets that stands out for me um, and kind of gets to where, how we got to this um, was that the funding for home visiting service coordination has been inconsistent, has come from different sources and has not been available to all communities. Um, dedicated state level staff who provide support and technical assistance and other resources to folks who are doing the work locally. I think those were some of the drivers for this one. So I don't know if that helps illuminate a pathway to a better or to an improved recommendation. Melissa, I think you're next. Uh, thank you. I wasn't sure. Um, so with the pulling of funds, and I and I literally just stated this yesterday on an AHIP webinar, like we have to come together on these things. We have to get out of our siloed boxes and funding being siloed is also a problem. But I think we can kind of specify um, with the pooling of funds, ensuring um, flexibilities are integrated into that um, according to funding source. And, and there's a way to do that. But if we keep funding things, like if we take housing, for instance, we have, you know, housing departments, we have Medicaid pushing funds, we have different federal sources that are moving funds in counties. And it's just, it, and then they're all doing their own thing and trying to do their own thing with different pools of money. When we can kind of work together strategically as communities to, to create innovative, collaborative approaches, and, and it does start with funding. Ruby, I, I can't see if people's hands are up or not on my screen. So if people have hands up. Nope, nobody else, Peter. So I think you're good to, to make sure that um, Robin's comments um, that were in the chat, there was one, not sure if the pooled fund would also be a decision maker, um, but I really like the concept of, it, of like a neutral lead. So and I don't think, and I don't want to, co-chairs let me know but it wasn't that that would be a decision maker but it was more like how is there more of that to your point Robin like by pulling the funds right from multiple sources departments sectors that it is then a neutral <laughs> resource in some ways that is meant to just move forward the recommendations and it was sort of around also not just moving like putting them into action but also like what's the maintenance and sustaining support for those recommendations. So I'm trying to uh, rain, trying to write out some words in the chat here to see if this is actually what people want to get to. 
Um, develop a clear process to align and leverage funds from public and private uh, sources that will finance implementation and maintenance of the recommendations. So I, I, I'm hearing that people are having a problem with pooled funds because it's not clear how it is um, or what that would be. But I think what the goal seems to be is that people want to make sure that there's an ability to combine funds in strategic ways uh, that can actually leverage resources and get to the um, outcomes that are desired. Mm -hmm. We could also say, well, you have from, from public and you did say and private um, that can flexibly finance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can try this out, Peter. I know you're doing a good job capturing. So it sounds like if we were if we were going to wordsmith and Robin, for sure, make sure you feel comfortable with this since you were flagged it as a concern and others have shared their concerns too, but to develop a clear process to align and leverage funds from public and private sources that will flexibly finance implementation and maintenance of the home visiting system recommendations. That's what, just what I was typing. <laughs> Can I just make a friendly amendment to add equitably to, flexibly and equitably? Because that was one of the concerns is that it was inconsistent across the jurisdictions. Yep. All right. Which I discovered as I went back to the sub bullets. <laughs> so, I mean, we didn't catch it in our last meeting. So, If everybody can't see the chat, Peter has just put in a, um, uh, some wording, develop a clear process to align funds from public and private sources that can flexibly and equitably finance implementation and maintenance of the home visiting systems recommendations. So would love to hear how, how that sounds to folks. We need more discussion. I like it. Yeah, it looks good. I think maybe we just do a quick, Peter, should we do a quick like hands up, just a show of hands in terms of the fist to five to say, make sure that we have at least a three or above across uh, all the members. Sure. Okay, if everybody could just put your hands up in the screen or you can put it on the chat, either one, we make sure we can see your hands. And... Let's see, Brenda, Mary, there we go. Brenda, what's your, how about you? Okay, I think we got everybody. Did I miss anybody? Okay, I think we're all good. Yay, back to you, Ruby. Great, thank you. So um, then we're going to recommendation D here. Um, and I saw Brenda had a comment about this as well. Um, it's, is to conduct, this next one recommendation is to conduct a comprehensive assessment of all state funds that support home visiting to identify inequities in order to implement more equitable prioritization of resource allocation. And um, perhaps you all remember early uh, on in this process of co-chairs, we're working to compile some basic information about funding and it is complicated and nuanced and we felt like it was worth some, um, some more assessment and investigation. So that's that recommendation. Um, let's see. Next slide, please. And the final recommendation in this sort of big buckle, bucket of uh, the financial section is centered on wages and pay equity. So the work team recommends conducting and using data from a pay audit to inform strategies to improve compensation, meaning wages and benefits, um, with special considerations for pay equity for racially and linguistic, linguistically diverse home visitors. So the pay audit should really include um, one, to make sure the pay audit includes 
programs um, where home visiting is the primary method of service delivery. So the programs like Healthy Families Oregon, Nurse Family Partnership, and also those for whom it's a supplemental or secondary service. Um, so Head Starts, Relief Nurseries, and a variety of other programs um, that, that do this kind of work, but not as a primary, as a primary work. Um, I think that concludes the financial section and I will pass it over to Gwen. Thanks, Ruby. Um, all right, so I'm gonna, um, whoops, Kelly, next slide. We'll move it to workforce. So there were a few recommendations here um, for workforce um, and they really focus around like recruitment, retention, um, professional development and ongoing professional development and also um, supportive supervision. So really sort of a holistic approach to um, supporting the workforce. So the first recommendation was on recruitment and retention and it's to collaborate and engage with cross-sector partners and communities, including rural, to analyze the challenges related to recruiting and retention of a diverse workforce, implement known culturally responsive strategies, and make technical assistance available. And we did get um, a comment on this. Um, Peter, do you want me to read that comment or do you wanna take it from here? I've got Go for it. it. Yeah, so the comment we received was, that um, should include analysis of level of credentials needed for home visiting given the nursing shortage. So it was, I think, a recommendation to add in here that not just collaborate and engage, but to also do an analysis of um, credentials. So turn it over to you. That, that was me, uh, Melissa. And, you know, really, I think we rely a, a lot on nurses, and um, I I think we do in the Family Connects, and we do in various other areas. I know the county does. Um, so is that entirely necessary through all these home visiting programs? And, and so just making sure that that's a mention, like, what level of staffing? Because if we're having challenges with staffing, we need to think creatively and not constrict that. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, we've been working here. We, we actually have a, a group of volunteers called Grandmas to Go, and uh, they are not licensed, uh, but they're doing really good work with a certain uh, level of support for families. Uh, for families that don't, don't need uh, the level of a nurse practitioner. So uh, I think that's a really good suggestion. Um, I'm just wondering uh, to analyze uh, a, a diverse workforce comma, including um, unlicensed. Do you, want, do, you, do you want to mention unlicensed or including um, a wide variety? Yeah, there are lots of uh, both nurse and non-nurse home visitors, Christy mentions. Uh... I, I'm not sure that totally works. So to analyze the challenges related to recruitment and retention of a diverse workforce with consideration for um, levels of credentials or something. Or with instead of credentials like qualifications. And you're recommending Melissa to have that after to so it's related to recruiting and retention of a diverse workforce. And then what was the language you wanted to put in there? With related the to recruiting and retention of a diverse workforce and consideration for workforce qualifications. I think Peter's got it in the chat. That looks like you. Oh, let me look. Sorry. It looked almost like a verbatim almost. <laughs> Good job, Peter. Yeah. Looking yeah. 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 yeah, I think that works. Robin, did you have a question? Yeah, I think it's a comment. Um, the question comment is around, I start, I found myself on the this one in particular. The feeling like we were solving 
I wanted to get clear while we were solving this problem, while we were approaching the workforce, um, because I feel like what we're saying is because of shortage and inequity and different um, needs that might be across, that that may be one of the pieces to solve in a uh, the barriers to relationship because I found myself thinking like we're are we what problem are we solving because there's shared professional development could be a tool for coordination is a tool for coordination but this I started getting into like this is like something we should be working on as like but maybe not at this committee so I just need help with like this is in this recommendation for coordination and system development because like, I, I just want more clarity from others um, because I can get behind the things a hundred percent, but is it in this recommendation for better systems development? So to try to parse that out, I mean, if, if we're saying we need to analyze the challenges related to a diverse workforce, we are saying there are challenges to a diverse workforce in this space, right? So I, I feel like that's kind of clear, but I do feel as though diverse workforce, and I think adding that consideration to levels of, of qualification, um, give us something extra so it's a little more broad than we just have challenges and diversity um, It because it's more than that. So sort of agreeing, but sort of not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, can we answer the question, if we solve this, we think this will happen. Can we, like, this is what, we have to solve these a lot of things, but we're okay. trying to solve this because we think it'll help in this. I just wanted to have like help thinking about how this, it's like going back to purpose kind of. Well, so then the second sentence could help there a little more too. And sorry, I'm a policy person by trade, so you can pick this part all day, but um, you know, implement known culturally responsive strategies and workforce strategies. So implement known culturally responsive and creative workforce strategies um, and make technical assistance available. Would that, would that help? Because we're saying- That doesn't sound right. Um, I, I guess my thing is, what are you trying to, what's the, what are we trying to accomplish here? And what's the end goal? Um, and when we're saying that we're having troubles trying to recruit, why are we having troubles trying to recruit workforce in this particular area? Because there is a big workforce in this area in within communities of color. So, and, and lower income folks. So I'm, I guess I'm trying to under, better understand what the problem is. Benjamin, you had your hand raised, but do you want me to address that? Or do you have a response to that? I, I Again, pulling up the... Um, yeah sort of the sub bullets, uh, there were some broad categories on this one around compensation, not being competitive, equitable, or on parity with other similar you know, uh, credentials. Um, there's a lack of diversity. Um, I know <clears throat> this wasn't admittedly from any of the materials we read, but it happened to be a meeting that I had with one of the programs we fund where they said they had difficulty hiring bilingual, bicultural, folks because they could make $7 an hour more working for other organizations, um, which that's significant and um, over the course of a year. So I think what, what we were trying to address was a lack of cultural and linguistic diversity. Um, there's a lack of workforce in general um, and uh, that the pay disparities in, in, in a, um, re, it was a regional, um, but we found in Oregon, it was consistent that um, Black, indig Indigenous, and other people of color um, often made less, um, you know, 25 cents or more or less an hour than their white counterparts. And so how do we get to a place where um, home visiting is a place that represents the communities that we are working in? 
Um, I, I don't know if that eliminates so, anything or if you have something to add, Gwen. Well, well, for me, I think some of the terminology that I'm hearing is very, um, doesn't feel good and doesn't sound good. Um, and so how do we get to where we need to be? And then also, can we think about places on where we need to post um, positions and jobs? Um, but I think we can come up, if we can have a little bit more time to work on this, I would be happy to work on the terminology um, because it sounds very um, demeaning a little bit in some of what I'm hearing and how we're trying to put this. And I wouldn't. I would ignore it too if I was looking for a position in this area. And I'm just being honest. I'm sitting here mm -hmm. listening. I'm thinking, oh my God. Um, but it's really yeah. equitable workforce strategies because it's it's about pay, it's about diversity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm wondering, so, so Serena, I, I want to make sure that, you know, so I'm gonna um if it's some of the language that, you know, like some of the terms that are being used, we can address those. And when- Absolutely. Kind of back, yeah, yeah, so let's do that. I also wanted to add that one um, kind of to Robin's question around where does this kind of fit in? I, it, it, you know, from kind of going through all this work and working with, you know, all the information we had, to me, this one linked pretty closely or directly to some of the responses we got from the families that we did some of those checkpoints with, like, how does this feel? Where I was, and I couldn't pull it up quickly enough, but where yeah, parents but were saying like that they, that they would really like more individuals, like more home visitors that represent them themselves, whether culturally. And, and Gwen, I understand that. And then we need to say, I, I understand that. And I know that from my experience, but I'm what I'm saying is the conversation that I'm hearing doesn't feel good to me. Okay. And then when I look at this, including rural, that sounds like othering rural when it should be partners in rural communities, you know, rural communities. I just think that we can say some things that's not othering and that's more inclusive language is what I'm saying. Um, that's not so demeaning, but really bringing people along. Yeah, and I I also think you know there's it's it's peer supportive too that peer model like the doula workforce is now mm -hmm. integrating peer support specialist training where it's, you know there's some focus on SUD and bringing bringing that perspective in so we're doing active listening to these individuals as we're you know in their homes and screening right. and helping them get connected to community support so um rolling that in a little bit too creating equitable place places and spaces right mm -hmm. um inclusive. yeah and and more inclusive and not so much othering but um because i think there's always this rule and rule divide, but how do we bring rule in so they don't feel like we're othering or we're not being inclusive, but they're part of the conversation and they're just not in parentheses, including rule. Well, we can just put them in there and we know that they're being included too as well. So to get to some of the language, so removing the including rural would help in a way that, because communities is inclusive, that we're saying that that's- Right, and we can say, in, rural partners with cross-sector partners and rural communities you know it's not yeah. or mm -hmm. or just rural communities and taking the and out it's just some mm -hmm. better ways to say it yeah so peter put on everybody to feel like they're part of it right and they have accessibility to everything that we're offering mm -hmm. no I, I really appreciate the point of the othering and potential demeaning in that way so that's let's see um, that was my two cents. I'm, I'm gonna get off my preaching board. Um, <laughs> stay on it, Marie. Stay with us. <laughs> You're in good right. company. <laughs> so, Peter put in collaborate and engage with cross sector parties or partners in all communities to address the challenges of recruiting, recruiting and retention of a diverse workforce. Implement known culturally. And I would suggest maybe culturally appropriate strategies and make technical assistance available to equitably expand the workforce. And then Robin has some other frame. Let's 
It's a lot of good stuff in there. Got it. Okay. Sorry, just trying to catch up on the chat here. Do you want me to read those out loud? I'm not sure if everyone has access. I, I think they do. Okay. Anyone want to share what they've put in the chat with the group? I think, Mary, do you have a suggestion um, around that kind of moving the focus from like the individuals, like the workforce, you know, those individuals to more of the policies or system? I think I'm with Serena at the moment, but I don't, I feel like I need more essentially to come up with the language, but just the way that it too often, I think in these conversations about not having a diverse workforce, we make it sound like the problem is the people who are not recruiting. Um, and so I'm uh, it kind of, because of the way it's written, it says, like if you read it technically, it doesn't say that, but it kind of feels that way. So I'm trying to, I don't know how to word it differently though. So, unfortunately, just raising a challenge, not a solution, which I don't usually like to do. Um, but yeah, I, I will keep thinking about it. I can reword it in a way that makes it feel less that way and more focused on the challenge. I always say as us because I've always represented the system or the program or whatever. Like I think of it as the challenge when I am not hiring diverse people as me and the processes and the way I'm recruiting that sort of thing. In this case, I'm not the us. So, but making it about that, not about the people. But again, it comes down to equity. We're hearing pay, we're hearing diversity, we're hearing peer. So equitable and inclusive. So if we get rid of that diverse comment, which narrows it, then, you know, that would help. Peter, was that your rewriting? That's, I like that. That's good. That's a great start. Mm -hmm. We might, we might wonder wanna... if that's a, oh, go ahead, Peter. Apologies. No, I was just going to say maybe we should uh, continue on and, and, and bring this one back in uh, the second half of the meeting when we're trying to get consensus and do a little bit more work on this, see if we can get to something that we can feel good about after pondering it a bit. You might, Peter, we might want to just temperature check. Would you be willing to call just for the FISTA 5 on uh, recommendation F and see if we have people that are at least three or above? That will help us know. If they're not yet, that will help us too. Sure. Uh, and you're referring to the what, the rewrite of it I did in the chat or the, or the I think people, people have already voted on it once as it is. Right. No, as the rewrite. Yep. The rewrite that you just did. Maybe you would read it one more time. Or I sure. Can. Collaborate and engage with cross-sector parties and all communities mm -hmm. to address the challenges of recruiting, it should be of recruiting and retention of a diverse workforce. Implement known culturally responsive, uh, culturally, uh, someone had a better word than that, um, culturally uh, responsive strategies and make technical assistance available to equitably expand the workforce. I think ben Benjamin has a different one here. Collaborate and engage with cross-sector parties and all communities to address the challenges of recruiting and retention of a diverse workforce, implement known culture responsive strategies, and make technical assistance available to equity expand the workforce. Yeah, that's it. So are people yeah, I was just to... pulling it up for people to not have that's to it. scroll back. Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. They, they would suggest and take out the word diverse uh, from the first sentence and uh, to do equity or culturally not responsive, but culturally appropriate. I can't remember what the word was that was suggested. Yes, that was what I su had suggested. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm I'm still having trouble. So then, I talked about uh, recruiting and retention of an equitable and inclusive workforce. And then implement known culturally appropriate, equitable, and peer-supported strategies. Can we say culturally competent? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. 
competency is a, is a big factor, right? Yeah. I, I think I, because the state changed how they talked about that too. And, and are we using the competency more now? Yes, we are. It's appropriate. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and that looks good. Just fine. That looks five for me. <laughs> okay. So we're looking at how the last rewrite that um, I think Benjamin, you rewrote it for us. Is that right? No, I just re elevated for... Peters. Oh, okay. So we need to know. No, I'm not seeing for... a rewrite. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing one yeah, it's thing. in there under um, Benjamin. Yeah, Benjamin reposted uh, Peter's, but I Peters, think Peter's yeah. working on those last edits. Is that correct, Peter? I'm trying to do the last edits here yeah. right now. <laughs> Good. Yeah, I, so, <laughs> I think so, I can see him typing away. <laughs> I don't know if there's a problem with my system because I'm not seeing it. I'm, I know I'm having a little bit of internet challenges right now. Can someone read it? I'm sorry. I'll read it in just Doesn't a second. Do that. I'm just gonna get the last words here. Uh, assistance. What we got is, come on, come on fingers. It is uh, collaborate and engage with cross-sector parties and all communities to address the challenges of recruiting and retention of an equitable workforce. Implement known culturally, uh, I misspelled something, implement known culturally competent strategies and make technical assistance to expand the workforce. And we'll put in chat here in a second. Would we like to include inclusive? Of an inclusive equitable? Yes. Yeah. So retention of an equitable and inclusive workforce. All right. And then the second sentence. I don't know why I'm stuck on this peer supported. <laughs> um, does anyone um, have a I, strong I, I, desire in that realm too, or is it just me? Um, I, I have a thought on that one. This is Kate. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're talking about um, an equitable and inclusive workforce that and, and um, we know we're talking about, you know, more inclusiveness anyway, in, in more general, I feel like that includes mm -hmm. um, the, the peer support as part of the workforce. Yes. Because there's a whole lot of different types of, of providers within the workforce and peer support is is a really critical provider within that inclusivity and that would be culturally competent as well yeah yeah i mean there's yeah. that includes community health workers, i buy that doulas a, a peer support the whole range of what it takes to be able to support families in their communities okay i'll be a five now thank you <laughs> I feel like if we start calling out, then we're going to start calling out everybody and we're going to miss somebody. I think if we use the word just an inclusive workforce, the intention is that it is inclusive and includes the whole range of providers. That was to the point that Serena was making earlier as well. So, yeah. yeah. If, if folks are, are, are uh, comfortable with doing a fist to five, if you either in the chat or on your I can't see everybody, so I'm, I'm just trusting that somebody can see everybody. <laughs> I'm, I'm not seeing everybody. Not everybody's on camera. So if you're not on camera, maybe you can put it in the chat. I think it maybe just Brenda. That, did we get Brenda's vote there? There we got it. Okay, thanks, Brenda. Oh, we got it. We're good. Great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for. Um, taking the time on that and, and sharing. Yeah, that's great. Okay, um, so the next one um, is G on the professional development system. So, and this one did not have any comments, specific comments to it um, from the survey. Um, this is work with Oregon's home visiting collaborative program state and national partners to leverage existing resources 
um, to create an equitable integrated approach for professional development, including career pathways. And then some sub bullets, all roles within the home visiting system workforce will be included and supported and examine the potential for home visitors to gain um, community health worker certificates. It looks like the language in here is pretty inclusive already, unless somebody saw something that was. This was all three or above in the survey, yeah. so. Great, all right. So next slide then, Kelly. So the next workforce recommendation is to, uh, around reflective supervision, increase the home visiting system's capacity to provide reflective supervision training, um, facilitating attuned interaction. Oops, sorry, it's all in the parentheses. So increase the home visitors, uh, home visiting systems capacity to provide reflective supervision training. Examples include the, um, the mental health endorsement, IME. I don't, yeah, okay. Um, mental health school. endorsement. Oh, thank you. Um, just wanted to make sure I wasn't jumping to conclusion and facilitating attuned interactions training. And then Peter, there was um, a comment. We had one comment on this. I can read that um, before we open it up for discussion. Um, and it was and just when like, maybe yeah. just on this one that the comment that uh, is on the two or less that's connected to both of these. So maybe just go ahead and read oh, both of them. Okay. And then thank you. That if they're, the comments are linked. So got it. Okay. So then the second one, um, or I, ongoing training, provide ongoing training and coaching to increase culturally responsiveness, to increase cultural responsiveness, as well as knowledge and skills to work with families with children with special needs, families experiencing interpersonal violence, mental health concerns, and or substance dependency. And so the comments that we received is, um, individual said, I gave it to you because it seems like an orange and an apple basket. Another way to say it is, this is like very specific recommendation, although it's great, it's very specific. And I kind of, I had a little bit of a question on that. It's specific to like reflective supervision. Maybe um, we can get some more information on that. And then the second comment was um, specific to I was again, uh, not disagreeing with this idea, but does it help us improve the system of coordination or is this a workforce development strategy? Does this committee have the role of workforce development strategy? So I'll open that up. Those were the comments and Serena, I see. Oh, instead of saying cultural, cultural responsiveness, cultural competency, mm -hmm. as well as knowledge and skills so that we can stay consistent. This is Kate. I was wondering about that comment about um, that it was the specificity. Was that around the reflective supervision specifically? I'll, not I sure. will, I was the commenter. Um, okay. I feel like apologizing, but I'm not because I just was stating my comments, which, um, you know, we've been working on band training across the state with, in partnership with our McVie friends. These are just very specific. And I found myself like professional development together, all that can help with the system and the building relationship but it felt a very, it just felt like the wrong size of recommendation, but that could just be about where I'm viewing the role of this committee. Um, because, you know, I'm a huge workforce development fan, so I love all of this and wanna just go down that path, but I just found myself wanting to make sure we were in the right lane. Um, so those are my comments. And I think the reason that came up, Robin, is that it, it came up in our section for workforce of reflective supervision, um, often being an uh, antidote to burnout and um, people departing their position when, when home visitors received effective reflective supervision, um, particularly um, in these areas of stressors where home visitors uh, may lack a strong sense of competency in working with families who have children with special health needs, special health needs, um, substance use disorders, mental health um, issues, or um, intimate partner violence. So that I think that's how that arrived there. 
Yeah. And I feel like um, if it's so we have equitable access to all of those kinds of supports across the models, across the state in, in every community, then that builds relationship because there isn't a, well, they get access to this and we don't, and they have that and we don't. If that is the purpose, then like, yes, I get behind it 100% so that I just need to talk through like why we're recommending something and how it links to systems coordination. So. Thank you. Serena, do you have your hand up? Just check in. You're okay, okay. <laughs> Got it. So to make I sure. Think so Serena did make a comment around changing um, the yeah. responsiveness um, in I to culturally, um, to cultural competencies. So I, I just, I added in, made that switch and just put in the chat. It's trying to save you a little time there, Peter. <laughs> so I give you a break on that one. But if there was any other suggested, it's interesting. Did I capture that as as intended by you? Okay, great. And then I just want to check in with Robin to see like if a wording change on either either or both of these around the equitable access across all models, if that would help attend to your concern there. So providing equitable access across all models. Uh, for training and coaching to increase da da da. I think that's fine. Yes, thank you. Something like that. To it should be equitably provide reflective supervision training with the examples throughout the state. Does that work for you, Robin? Something along those lines. Absolutely. I think, again, the statement to me isn't the, the concern that I have. It was more that like we think reflective supervision for everyone will help people work better together so that we are coordinated in a system versus we all, I mean, reflective supervision needs to be available for quality in the workforce, for retention of the workforce. What are we trying to solve as this committee? Is it working across models? And in, to do that, we need to have equitable access to training and we need to have similar language that we use across models so that we can communicate those relationships and work together on behalf of families. That like, those are the, like the ways that my, my brain's trying to like sequence it. Um, versus how do we develop a great workforce in Oregon and whose job is that and how are we going to do that? That's like there's, I, I'm I think I might be separating things more than I need to. So please push back and tell me where I can understand better in any of these <laughs> long-winded statements that I have. <laughs> I really appreciate, Robin, no, I really appreciate that because I'm thinking back to some of the like how this kind of got glumped in Ruby or Benjamin or Chrissy, like that what you're saying was some of those comments that we had from the working team around sort of really building the system of kind of like shared language across all, you know, just like really having this be sort of a collective workforce, right, that has, that doesn't feel so um, by program or age serve, like that it was so unique, right, that their thing was so unique that it was really meant to um, be inclusive of all and that, that kind of shared approach. So Peter, I don't know if we need to do, and Chrissy for this kind of process here, do we need to do the new language on age and do a fist to five there and then do it for I as well with the new language that's in the chat? Is that where we're at, Peter? I, I think we'd actually even just say, uh, is everyone comfortable with this? If someone's uncomfortable, uh, well, we do fits to five. Let's do the fits to five. We've been doing that consistently. So people could just put in the chat whether uh, with the language that uh, it should be equ equitably provide and then the uh, the change to culturally competencies uh, that Gwyn put in the chat. If the if Gwyn's language and my language are okay to move on with, uh, five, four, three, two, one. We got it. Okay. We're doing great. We're doing great. All right. So I think I think the next section. Thank you very much for all that on the workforce recommendations. Um, Benjamin, I'll hand it off to you for the structures. Okay. So in the interest of time, 
I see that we're about 20 minutes to the end of the meeting. So I'm going to just acknowledge that this was, you know, shared that we should be able to create family centered, family focused, um, coordinated entry and referrals to other services. So this um, had an average of 4.25. There was a high agreement. So if we could go to the next slide. The, um, and, and I'm going to just note too, and we'll touch on them, but the, this uh, North Star K is the only one that didn't have a four or above in this section um, as in terms of the collective uh, vo voting previously. So there were concerns of what this meant, um, and it felt vague um, that there, again, wasn't disagreement, but that there was an opportunity to be more clear. So I do invite us to get more clear on this. I think what we were trying to say is that, um, and I'm sure Brenda can tell me this better, or talk about this better than I can, but the communities are not looking for us to tell them what to do, but they're also not looking for us to hand them a problem to solve independently. Um, they want state partnership in co-creating solutions to implementation of new activities or models or whatever it may be um, that they want to do that in partnership. So it's not, you know, it's that balance of not being told what to do, but not being handed a problem. So I don't know if that helps resolve the the question that was that had emerged about this previously. We also, as we were, sorry, as we were getting ready for the meeting, realized that this could be sort of taken out of a recommendation per se and just be something that's more of a working agreement or something that's aspirational. I wonder if this is more of an overarching context or framing for all the recommendations as sort of the intent of this group is that it is a state and local kind of partnership um, and the state wants to be there to support um, local decision making and implementation and and that's the framing for all of these recommendations just a thought since it is a north, north star it should be a north star for everything i would think because <laughs> we don't have the southern cross here or or Ryan <laughs> anybody else so. <laughs> I like that, Kate. I like that direction. Mm -hmm. So we could take it out of the recommendation, see if I'm checking in right, like actually remove it as a recommendation. So K would get stricken <laughs> this North Star instead would actually get lifted up to the constellation level. So either part of the working agreements and or part of the charter and mm -hmm. or as a lead statement of some kind or, you know, a lead statement for the whole the whole collection of recommendations. But at this time to remove it from the from the recommendations, that's a possible that's a possibility. Fist to five on that. So fist to five on removing it, but making sure mm -hmm. that it's a strong part of language uh, in other parts of the committee and working team documents. Looks like we got five. Brenda, Rick, you guys good. Hard to see everybody wants, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I think everybody's good. All right. Um, so as we as we started, we talked about there are little pockets of good things happening. So we wanted to acknowledge that that in some places we have some good uh, opportunities for family leadership, but again, they're not even across the state. So how do we create? Uh, how do we build on what exists and 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 strengthen it, um, and then leverage and expand in some cases, perhaps streamline, and I have some ideas, but I'm not going to get us stuck here, existing home <laughs> visiting advisory committees or bodies, um, such as the Home Visiting Collaborative, MIGB Advisory, et cetera, to find new efficiencies and better represent home visiting program staff at the same, at the same time, better represent program staff and families who are, are receiving the services. Um, so a likely first step would be to create an action plan to move these recommendations to action. Next slide. So the framework, um, the working team really landed on sort of a, a combination of stuff that exists in the build home visiting planning tool, as well as the board family foundation home visiting system coalition, coalition, is that what the C is there? Um, sorry, Robin. <laughs> 
uh, the theory of action, um, creating and maintaining trusted relationships at all levels through internal communication, establishing state and regional cross-sector collective decision-making um, and monitoring of the home visiting system through leadership and governance. We talked about financing, creating processes for continuous quality improvement and assessment, uh, workforce recruitment, retention, and professional development, messaging and outreach. How do we raise awareness and normalize home visiting as something families want? Um, and then coordinating intake or referral. Um, so family-centered home visiting, family-centered processes, family-focused um, processes for entering home visiting services and other services. Next slide. So, oh, establishing and supporting a process for ongoing home visiting system assessment. So what data will we collect and report to observe progress toward our success, as well as assisting programs and ongoing quality improvement. Um, one example that came up is the Ford family does this in an ongoing way in terms of monitoring how well uh, folks know other programs and have trusting relationships through a survey process, just as one example. And then how might we integrate state level data and in interoperability uh, so that we can um, have useful data for decision making. So knowing that it's highly unlikely that we will get every program across every sector, across the whole state to use one Uber data system, how do we create um, shared data definitions so that when we're pulling data from the multiple systems people are using, we have some, some level of comparable data. And that was it for me. I think it's Christy now. Unless I should pause just quickly to, to say I went through my section rather quickly because I want to respect you people's have, time. You have one more, Benjamin. I do. Okay, next slide then. Oh, you're right. Outreach and messaging. Oh, so how do we create a comprehensive model inclusive? It said neutral. I, I inserted inclusive because I'm trying to shift us to that language. Uh, marketing and communication plan to promote awareness of home visiting. Uh, services, their purposes, the impact, leverage existing using existing communication pathways and ensure that the communication plan and materials can be tailored for local communities. Um, at the regional level, consider developing single resource for families that describes the types of services that are available and then aligning legislation and rules. So uh, taking the time to review statute rules and funder requirements of existing home visiting models to determine where there are opportunities for better alignment, um, including going forward, assessing and assuring that alignment um, is done before we implement new rule or legislation, and then collaborating with communities regarding the introduction of new home visiting models as they emerge. Now I'll say pause because I did run through mine quickly in order <laughs> to try to get us out on time. So if there was anything that I ran past that someone says, wait, we need to go back, So I, I think we're scheduled to do, actually go to 1230. Uh, if oh, okay. There's nothing wrong with the uh, ending early, though, people. Okay. Uh, Sorry, I, I thought it was 12. No, <laughs> no. Like, it, oh, no. <laughs> like, you, 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 did, you did a great job. And uh, I think those are great recommendations. I, I applaud everybody for those recommendations. And as you noted, they all got over four uh, on the from the survey or four or above. I have just one really quick comment about the outreach. I made it in the survey. Um, always outreach strategies to me are associated with capacity. Um, so as we increase our outreach and effective communication and destigmatize the services, can we meet the growing identified population? Um, and there was nothing in any of these recommendations about growing the availability of home visiting services. So I want that specific goal of mine. Um, but so thinking about just as we're moving to the next phases, um, how to tie that outreach to expanded capacity to meet families' needs, or if there's already an awareness that there's kind of unutilized capacity right now, we can plug those people into kind of connecting those two. So just a comment.
did it come up in the discussions whether we might want to suggest the early learning hubs be a possible single resource for families that describe the types and purposes of home visiting programs? No, we're not. We haven't gone there yet, Peter, to okay. be honest, but <laughs> I think that's uh, to be determined and I might touch on it or hope to touch on it in the uh, later slide for sure. It's a big question. Sure. Thanks, Robin. That is a how. That's right. Sure. Well, we've we've talked through the entire list of recommendations. Uh, we've done some revisions to get to uh, uh, agreement. And um, I think that uh, we're in a good place that, that uh, Peg and I can take these now to the uh, Early Learning Council next week. Um, so it, it, unless anybody has additional concerns or uh, notes, et cetera. We kind of, we kind of, we had a, go ahead. I think we should say, Krista, did you want to talk about the low hanging fruit? Sure. Yeah, should we go ahead and take the break that was scheduled and then come back with this one and then we can talk about, this is also really nicely connected to next steps too. So I don't know, Peg and Peter, if you want to do that, um, a short one minute break. Uh, maybe sure. I need a one minute break and I'll be right back. Maybe I'll just sure. do that. Let, let's do it. That's let's okay. be, be generous. Let's do a whole two minute break. See you back. All right. in two okay. Couple minutes. Kelly, do you want to go to the next slide just so that folks that are here for the next minute and then we can go back. I may have just wanted it to end at noon because I have a 1230. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I better go get some peanuts. <laughs> if we get done, we can get a little, uh, little lunch break before 1230. That'd be good. We have Squirrel Highway in our backyard, so we have lots of power lines that run through the easement line between the two back properties, and so we spent a lot of time speculating about where in the world the squirrels could possibly be putting all of their stuff. <laughs> and Peter, I put a little note in there about if we could not use the term low-hanging fruit that was on there. Sure. Okay, thank you. Well, welcome back everybody. Hope we're back. And uh, let's see, Chrissy, I, I really think this, this next one yep. is for you, right? I think so. Yeah, can we go back just real quick to the previous slide, which was about, it's really, so the next set of slides is really a chance for the committee just to be a little bit more future oriented as we are thinking kind of now 
the um, what will be happening in the next kind of phases. And so this is really just um, a short list uh, of what I would kind of talk about as things that could move forward more quickly. Like some of the things are quite large, like a new professional development system may not be considered a quick action item, but there may be some items that are more actionable more quickly. And so these, this list came out of the work team surveys, uh, the work team co-chairs, uh, the committee check-in meeting. Some of you shared some low hanging or some ideas that would be able to be implemented more quickly, uh, interviews, et cetera. So we don't need to go through each of these, but um, we'll just talk about the first one, the investing in relationships and really reference back to the Ford Family Foundation's home visiting system coordination project in rural. And we did share their systems and they actually shared at the last meeting during their presentation that within a year, the relationship oriented questions that the local communities talked about and shared like improved communication, better understanding of one another's programs, higher levels of trust between leadership and between home visitors, those increases were marked and in a short period of time over the course of a year of networking opportunities and connecting opportunities at the local, meaning probably county and the regional level, meaning multi-county. So I just wanna just highlight that one in particular that we think of investing in relationships, it is a long-term effort, but it may not take as long as we think. And that just taking the time to really focus there is, a, is in fact something that could happen perhaps more quickly than we think of. Okay, I think we can move to the um, one, two, three slides down, Kelly. Uh, maybe four actually to next steps. There we go. So again, this is a lot about sort of setting the table or priming the pump, kind of getting the committee to percolate and think about what's going to be happening next. The, so the recommendation, so Peter and Peg will be moving forward the recommendations, I think with the removal of the North Star uh, with the changes that were made to the ELC meeting on December 14th. So Sue, you'll, you've got a big set of recommendations that you'll be able to share with the ELC and that Peg and Peter will be doing. So that's really our immediate next step. And then I would say thinking about during the like first quarter, first several months anyway, of 2023, the working team co-chairs, myself, the working team and others will be really thinking about like, how do we get from here to there? So what's our process and who are the people involved with creating the action plan about how to set the, how, how to create the document and the next, and the steps in the plan for, making these recommendations uh, into action. So that's not the action planning itself. That's like making sure that we have a really good process and that we have people a uh, high level of involvement across different sectors, including families across the state. The other kind of going to where the ball will be that I think is important uh, in terms of this recommendations to action is for both this committee and the Early Learning Council to be asking themselves about the staffing in FTE for the short term. So in 2023, who's, who's holding the vision, who's carrying the ball, who's staffing you know, committees and working teams and helping to drive an action planning process? So asking those questions, like who, who, is the, who are those people? What do they look like for the short term and also for the long term? And then housing. So Rick, I hope you didn't just start sweating because this isn't specifically like, uh, <laughs> O OHCS, but I thought it was cute to put it on there and then see if it might make you sweat just a tiny bit. But housing is really back to, I think, the question that was brought up by Peter. So thanks, Peter. And it came up in every interview uh, and it's come up over and over again in different parts of the conversation and parts of the working team, which is where does this work live? Where does this work live at the state level? for statewide support and where does this work at the regional or local level? And so of course there, there's, I think that I'm not looking for us to necessarily in any way answer those questions today, but I'm definitely asking the committee and then Sue I'm sure will be thinking about it and has been thinking about it in terms of, you know, maybe, 
thinking about what maybe your assumption is to the answer to those questions. Like you may have an assumed place or, or space in the state where you think, well, of course it should live here. Or, and at the regional level, like maybe of course it should live here. Uh, and that doesn't mean that that's right or wrong, but I would just ask you maybe to set aside your, your kind of the quick answer assumption and really ask yourself for, and give yourself a chance to think about, um, you know, percolate and consider the options. Hmm. So I think that there are different ways that this could be approached. So uh, I think I would just leave it at that part right there and then open this up a little bit for like ideas and, and comments, particularly, I would ask you to share if you've had experiences moving a body of recommendations like this forward into to more like action, I wonder what kind of successes you've had. Like what suggestions and, and ways of doing this do you think would be most beneficial and most successful? So open that up to the group and hear your thoughts about like getting from getting from recommendation to action, action planning. Christy, maybe we could do a stop the screen share for a minute so people can see everybody else. Yeah. And uh, sounds great. So again, this just open-ended question. Many of you have been involved in many processes like this, where you need to go from kind of a formal set of something that is the what, and now we have to start getting to the who and how. And I just wonder what what are successful approaches or strategies that you've been a part of, Melissa. Yeah, I'll provide some input here. Someone who's done a lot of policy implementation in their lifetime, pain, painful um, policy implementation. And um, I think really it comes down to understanding the details and having the right people at the table, because oftentimes we try to implement recommendations and then we're lacking in some space that has unintended consequences. Um, and so just being mindful of all the various players that we need to make sure we're capturing um, along the way their perspectives and how things will get implemented. If we make changes to workforce, does that, um, how does that get implemented in terms of, um, in terms of how people recruit, in terms of how people um, train their staffing? Do they have capacity for training? Do they have the funding for training? Are the training opportunities available? Who will provide those training opportunities? Those are gonna need to be things that we think about. If we have a pooled funding source, do we have um, the, F, the right FTE to be able to um, track that funding and ensure we're using it appropriately if it's with some flexible, some not so flexible? Um, funding aspects to it and folks that we have at the table managing that, we need to have um, commitments and how do we make that formal commitment? Do we need to do an MOU or um, thinking uh, just about those things alone? I also think about outreach and messaging because uh, messaging is not just for the people who are managing these things, it's for the people that need to integrate these services these screenings and home visitings into um, the community, thinking about family connects, like how do we get, you know, better access to maternity wards and, and how do we communicate the value of this to providers and get that message to the people that would benefit from these services, letting them know it's there and at intervals when um, they have a new child, then they're going to need to know at that point. So um, it integrates all work that um, the community does in this space. So that those would be my couple thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. What other words of wisdom would you have? Strategies for successful action planning.
I'll jump in and say <clears throat> the, the clarity of purpose and buy-in at all levels, which is a big statement that looks little. <laughs> <laughs> But that clarity, like, where are we going? How are we going to get there? What do we think is important to do it? Like that pathway, but buy-in, I think, and accountability. So buy-in, accountability is important. Thanks, Robin. I, I hate to be a bureaucrat because I'm by nature not a bureaucrat. <laughs> but I do think that there is power or, um, in having the the authority, the legislative authority to do the work. Because um, um, goodwill gets you a long way because people want to do the right thing. But um, when push comes to shove and, and budgets might get tight or um, you know the world just is a little different, um, goodwill sometimes then becomes my will, not our will. And, um, mm -hmm. but if there is legislative, um, direction and requirements and authority, it kind of um, says, well, nope, now everybody's got to play. So um, just kind of putting that out there. Thank you, Kate. Me again, sorry. Okay. Um, I appreciate regulations and I love authority being in place but I love authority with some flexibility and because that can result in some unintended consequences too, um, especially as we look at the diversity of the communities across Oregon. And I would further say too, accountability is necessary, but that can also result in administrative burdens. Um, and administrative burdens on our providers who need to spend their time in patient care and, and navigating patient support um, rather than completing very technical reports. Since a lot of the data that may come with the term accountability, the data that may be needed, um, may not be captured that way today and it may be a heavy lift. And if we do implement something like that, um, just being very mindful and not switching it up at every turn. One of my problems with OHA is they, we like over 225 deliverables and they change them like three times out of the year. So we're constantly <laughs> shifting. Those are great points. Those are great points. How do we make this uh, family friendly, totally family centered, but also provider friendly. Those are great aspirations. To have. <laughs> Anybody else on that? How to, uh, from your experience and wisdom, the going from recommendations to action, suggestions, words of wisdom? I, I really liked Robin's comments about the, the clarity of purpose. I mean, we're a lot of times, at least speaking from a for, as a former legislator, you, you want to get information quickly. So, so what is this? What are we doing? Why are we doing? And what's the outcome going to be? Uh, and I, I love that uh, that kind of approach to it because it gives you a chance to buy in and say, "Oh, we're doing something great, fantastic, let's go." Yeah, Rick. I think Brenda had her hand up longer than I. Oh, I'm Brenda. so sorry. Yeah. No worries. And thank you. Um, I, I just was thinking about Kate's comments about legislative fix. And I totally agree that having the legislation in place is really helpful. But the steps leading up to that and having the key buy-in, I think, is a lesson learned from my perspective on some of the Family Connects work in particular that maybe we weren't quite there. Um, and having that clarity up front, I think, um, would cement buy-in in a way that could get us where we um, need to go. The other thing that, and I wondered about the timing around that since we're coming up on another session, it isn't like we don't have a session every year, but we are on the uh, the years that there's more time 
to uh, really kind of have that on ramp um, for discussion. So, so wondering kind of how how that looks and wanting to be thoughtful about that and not try to um, move it so fast that it's more pushback um, than it is helpful. Um, the other thing, um, and I appreciated um, Peter, you bringing up earlier the early learning hubs. Um, I think that we do have a, a potential role in certainly helping convene and tease out um, planning at the regional level. And not that I would ever offer up all of my um, colleagues, but but I do think that that is a specific role um, that we fill and that we're um, getting uh, really consistent with. Um, across the state, and so I'm happy to say that. Um, I and I also think um, that 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 we are attuned to helping find who the local champions, and if we aren't the lead, I think that's okay, and we all recognize that. But whoever the the logical lead is in the region, so thank you so much, Brenna. And I just have more of a comment, probably. Uh, just that that as I was going through these, uh, it, it it was not lost on me the the massive amount of work associated with each one of these recommendations. I think you you each each recommendation itself is a huge project in and of itself. And so I think I think just recognizing that fact and making sure that you have the right SMEs and and partners and and, and figuring out, you know, what what that project looks like, what that timeline looks like, whether or not it it overlaps into some of these other groups and where those touch points are. So just mapping each one of these out and and trying to figure out who who needs to be at the table, I think is just that's your first step. Um, and and then assigning it to to folks that that can be your champion to lead that effort and make sure um you can push that forward so I, I don't know if that's helpful you probably have already know all those things i was just looking at it from how i would move forward with those with that so what, what's an sme subject matter expert oh there thank you <laughs> aka known as dr hook's right hand person <laughs> <laughs> in peter pan Anybody else want to share out on that question? It's been so helpful. Go ahead. Oh, oh sorry, Serena. Um, oh, and I just want to say, um, I understand um, um, that we have to structure because I love structure. That's my thing. But also say that we have to figure out where that balance of a um, flexibility is um, as we're going, um, because our legislature is looking different this year. It's the most diverse legislature we have had in the state of Oregon. Um, and there's going to be a lot of training for them too. Um, and so that flexibility matters because our communities look different now that our, our legislators are look different, our demographics in our state is changing. And so making sure that we're in tune with that, but also being intentional about our work. And then I just want to say, I'm always going to bring that equity lens. And so not that I'm apologizing for it because that's just who I am. Um, that's just my passion and to make sure that we're serving all folks um, in an equitable in an equitable and inclusive way and making sure that we're bringing folks along with us um, as well as teaching and then learning is always that we're going to do. Um, and so, yes, I just wanted to say that. And I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much, Serena. Well, thank you very, very much. Those are really helpful words of wisdom. This won't be the first time I'm sure that we'll be having conversations around those kind of next steps percolating questions that are there. Um, but I think that that's the end of that section as well. And I would turn it back over to Peg and Peter um, for kind of our wrap up. Peg, I'll pass it over to you. I'll just, just want to say thanks to everybody for your time and for your efforts and for your passion uh, for this, because we know that if we can, every step forward we take uh, with the home visiting programs is going to make a difference. So I just want to thank you. And thank you, Christy, for all your work. Over to you, Peg. Yeah. 
certainly repeat that uh, everybody's to thank everyone for all the efforts and the time they've put into this. And I guess to remind people that, I mean, that that absolute next step is that we'll be taking this to the council on the 14th of December. And then after that, we will be in touch again to, um, to kind of start work on the action plan. Uh, just to sort of summarize, I think some of the easy stuff that we can maybe start with <clears throat> in our communities is looking at um, how can we start to facilitate some of that relationship building, because that's going to be a real key piece in having this be successful, uh, both between programs, how can we communicate the benefits of um, uh, home visiting to families and um, in a way that seems like uh, it's supportive of them instead of being sort of imposed on them. Um, uh, but again, thanks again and I appreciate everybody's time. And we, we'll get back to you to, to organize another meeting uh, when it seems like the logical next step. And again, thanks everybody and uh, have great holidays, please. Yeah. Thank you.